Okay, uh, thank you very much for the introduction and uh, thank you for having me. So today um, I was speaking about my work on imaging of bionitrotropic periodic structures from electromagnetic new field data. And uh, <clears throat> this is John work with my advisor, Dr. Dan Limwin from Kansas State University. So there are four parts of this talk. So first I will introduce uh, briefly the setup of our problem. And then I will state the inverse problem interest along with the factorization method to, to solve this problem. And finally, I will um, show some numerical examples to see how the method performs uh, for this particular problem. So our problem is based on the scattering phenomenon in which we use some incident waves to illuminate a periodic structure. And the interaction between these waves and the structure gives rise to corresponding scatter waves. And then the direct problem would be, we know the physical properties of the structure and we try to compute the scatter waves. The inverse problem on the other hand is when we know some information about the scatter waves and we try to reconstruct the geometry of the structure. So the entire phenomenon is governed by the Maxwell equations. Uh, so in here, E and H are the electric and, and magnetic fields. Uh, D and B are the electric and magnetic flux densities. So in addition to these two Maxwell equations, we also consider two constitutive relations which represent bionitrotropic media. So um, in these conditions, uh, in these uh, relations, epsilon and mu are the permittivity and permeability of uh, the structure, which are complex value. C is called the magnetoelectric coupling coefficient, and it is real valued. So epsilon, mu, and C, they are all three by three matrix value functions. And we assume that in the background, they're just uh, proportional to the identity matrix. All right, so our structure, uh, uh, is uh, denoted by D0, uh, the geometry of our structure. And mathematically, it is the union of the supports of these three sets. And we assume that our structure is uh, two pi periodic in X1 and X2. It could be infinitely long in X1 and X2, but it is bounded in X3. And on screen, you can see some pictures of uh, uh, such structures in real life. So on the left, it is a perforated sheet that was uh, designed for a very specific uh, experiment. On the right, you can see some pictures of uh, diffraction gratings, which is a very important type of structures in optics. For the periodic setup, uh, we need to define alpha quasi periodic city. And this is a definition. So uh, Chong, are you mm -hmm. student uh, or a postdoc at the KSU? Oh, uh, I'm, a, I'm a PhD student. Yeah. PhD student with uh, Virginia or with uh, uh, Diego? Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm a student of uh, Lim, so this is my advisor. Oh, I see, I see. Okay, good. Yeah. Very good, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, uh, working on applied math, applied analysis, something. Yeah, yeah okay, I see. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, okay, so speaking of alpha quasi periodic city, uh, so for alpha, uh, which is a fixed uh, vector in three dimensions uh, with a zero third, uh, third component, uh, we define, uh, so a function u is called alpha quasi periodic if it satisfies uh, this identity. So this is uh, pretty much the same as uh, two pi periodic city in x1 and x2. The only difference is this uh, phase shift term on the right. And if we use alpha quasi periodic incident weights, it can be proved that the, the corresponding scatter waves will be alpha quasi periodic as well. And therefore our problem can be restricted to one period omega. Okay. Uh, so moreover, we also assume that um, the structure is bound in X2, uh, sorry, in X3. And therefore we can restrict further our problem onto this bounded domain omega H in which we only go from negative H to H in the X3 direction. So H is a is a positive number, uh, sufficiently large so that uh, our structure is inside uh, is uh, uh, inside this pure, uh, bounded domain omega h. So gamma, <coughs> I mean a period of our structure is inside omega h. So gamma plus and minus h are the upper and lower faces of omega h, which so these are where we have our data measured. 
Okay, so after doing some scaling and uh, doing some algebra, we can arrive at an equation involving only the, the electric field. So we have gotten rid of the presence of the magnetic field. Okay, so we denote by U the scattered electric field and it satisfies this equation. Okay. And <clears throat> to ensure that our scatter waves is uh, physically meaningful, we also impose the so-called Rayleigh radiation condition. So this condition says that uh, when X3 is above or below plus and minus H, uh, the scatter wave can be written as this series. And the coefficients uh, you have M plus and minus uh, are called the Rayleigh sequences of uh, the scatter wave, of this function U. So that's for the setup. Now we will state the inverse problem interest. And in order to state this problem, we need to define some important operators. In fact, we need to have three important operators. The first operator is called a forward operator. So we consider uh, it has to do with the, the data problem, the way posing it of the data problem. So uh, we have the variation of formulation for the data problem, uh, which is a, a little bit more general than what we saw earlier, uh, because F and G can be some genetic functions in L2. And <clears throat> here we use some special sobolet spaces uh, for the solution and for the test functions. Okay, okay so the web positiveness of the data problem is out of the scope of uh, our work. So we assume that the version of the problem is well posed and we just focus on the inverse problem. Okay. So uh, we assume the version of the problem is well posed and then we can define the forward operator G that maps a pair of F and G to the Rayleigh sequences of the first two components of the solution to this variation of problem. The second operator that we need to define is called a heck loss operator. And this operator has to do with the incident waves that we use. So we use for this problem, uh, incident blank waves of this form that are alpha quasi periodic. So note that the, <coughs> the polarizations, uh, PML and QML have to, have to be defined so that uh, they are linearly independent and uh, these function phi ML plus and minus have to be divergence free. So this is just a technical point for the analysis. Okay. And so we can define a head loss operator H as a function that acts on uh, these sequences of numbers. So we have four sequences of numbers and on the right hand side, we have this vector value function. So the action of H can be understood as follows. So we use these four sequences of numbers to form a linear combination of uh, incident waves of this form. And we use that linear combination as a new incident wave. And then we, we calculate the curve of the incident wave and we stack the curve uh, of, the sin of the incident wave and the incident wave itself into this vector and form the right hand side. Uh, so it can be proved that H is compact injective. And finally, we need a new field operator so the new field operator is just uh, the composition of uh, the previous two operators, G and H. So the action of N can be summarized as follows. So we give, we're given uh, four sequences of numbers. We can form an incident wave, which is a linear combination as we saw earlier. And the heck loss operator H will generate uh, the, vec the, the pair F and G, which are the curve of uh, incident wave and the incident wave itself. And then the forward operator G will generate a solution to the corresponding variation of problem. Okay. All right, so now we're ready to state the inverse problem interest. So the data for our problem will be the new field operator N. And the objective is to reconstruct the shape D of the scattering object. Okay. So note that this new field operator N can be computed if we know the scatter fields uh, you measure on the upper and lower faces of the domain omega h, which is uh, which are gamma plus and minus h, associated with all the incident wave waves that we use, okay. and such measurements of u are called new field measurements. And this inverse problems have uh, applications in non-destructive testing for photonic crystal. 
All right, so a little bit about uh, literature. So we, this is a, a non-exhaustive list of uh, work on this topic, ranging from the Hamilton equation to the Maxwell equations. So for the Maxwell case, uh, Sanford in 2010 studied the reconstruction of uh, two scalar coefficients. Uh, I mean, the, the shape of the structures characterized by two scalar coefficients. Uh, Trin, you mm -hmm. have a equation Mm -hmm. You want to use the matrix uh, operation to to solve it, and then you uh, want to get uh, you want to use the inverse of the matrix to get uh, the solution. So, uh, not really. So the the matrices are the coefficients or the these parameters. So. The, those parameters are, um, so we assume that in the background, uh, as yeah. you know, for example, this is uh, proportional to, uh, to the identity matrix, mu also the same, C is uh, zero. So what we want to reconstruct is D zero, which is the- We can, we can see that's uh, the initial data, right? Can we say, I mean, you have an equation, you have uh, the domain, you have uh, the, initial conditions, then you are trying to solve the equation or- uh, you, So we, or, actually we, we only use, so the, uh, the unknown in this, uh, in the equation is actually, uh, so we know U from the data and uh, yeah. the unknowns are epsilon, C and mu, but mm -hmm. we are not trying to, to solve for them. We just try to solve for the support, to, to solve for the, uh, the support of those functions because we are interested in just the geometry of the structure, not not the, the oh, functions. I see. Okay, I see. Okay. So you are trying to characterize the support of yes, exactly. the, the function. Okay, I see. Exactly, yes. Okay, I see. That's like the uh, CT, right? So you send the it, you send the re in, then you detect the long or star mark, and then you can try to get the image of, uh, right? Yes, exactly, yes. Yeah, okay, yeah. yeah, thank you, yeah. Okay, yeah, uh, so yeah, we are uh, we're trying to like image the, the structure that we are uh, we're interested in, yes, using some info from the electromagnetic fields that we use, yes. And, uh, okay, uh, so yeah, so. Uh, <clears throat> All right, so uh, let's go back to, to the literature. So also like uh, in 2014 and also in 2017, uh, Bao Kuen Li and also Zhang and Li studied the reconstruction of uh, periodic surfaces in the same manner. Uh, uh, in 2016, Wynn studied the reconstruction of uh, structures characterized by three scalar coefficients. So our work right here, focused on um, the reconstruction of uh, three matrix value coefficients. Okay. So, uh, I mean, the, the supports of uh, the, the set uh, of those functions that we saw earlier, yeah. But there are uh, essentially matrix value and we have three of them. Okay. All right, so now we look at the factorization method for solving this problem. And <clears throat> so the idea of the factorization method is that we want to we want to uh, reconstruct the geometry of the structure and hand. The way we do so is that we will build an indicator function, okay? So for a point Z, if a point Z is inside the structure, the indicator function will have a large value, a large positive value. And if, if the point Z is outside the structure, then the indicator function will be zero, okay? And if we can, con we, if we can construct such a, a function, then we can have an image of our structure. Okay. So that's the, the, the big picture of what we're doing. Okay. So in order to do so, we need some assumptions on a scattering object. And we need to assume that um, our structure is a Lipschitz domain and uh, the complement has, uh, has at most two connected components and those components uh, have to be unbounded in X3. Okay. Sorry. Also, we need some assumptions on uh, positivity of uh, these quantities. Okay. So 
and also we need uh, this assumption. So these assumptions are just for uh, technical reasons, but uh, we can in the in the final part of this talk, I will give an example of uh, a set of parameters that satisfy all these assumptions. And these assumptions actually make sense in practice because uh, they won't boil down to just having C very small. And C is the magnetoelectric uh, coupling coefficient. And for known materials in real life, uh, this parameter is uh, very small. Okay, so. All right. <clears throat> First, we prove a characterization of uh, the domain D, uh, the, the structure D that we're trying to reconstruct. So, which is stated in theorem one. So we define, so we know the, the Green's function for this problem is G and we define the uh, corresponding uh, Green's tensor. And if a function psi is given by this, where E3 is just zero, zero, one, then we have the following characterization of D. So a point Z belongs to D if and only if the Rayleigh sequences of uh, this function belongs to the range of S star. So this is a very nice categorization because uh, it's an if and only if condition. However, it's not complete because we cannot know the range of S star without knowing D. And D for the inverse problem is the unknown. We will try to reconstruct it. So, um, so what we do next is that we will establish a connection between the range of S star with something that we can know from the data. Okay, so um, that's what we're doing next. And the first step of establishing such a connection is to prove the factorization lemma. And this is why the, the method is called the factorization method because we, uh, we, we, we have this factorization. So we need to define the imaginary part of an operator X as in x equals this relation between, uh, I mean, this expression involving uh, the operator and its edge joint. And also we need to define an auxiliary operator t. And this, the definition is, is again, for just for technical reason. Okay. So we have in n equals h star in t h. And we can see here the new view operator. This is something that we know from the data. And so this is the first connection between, you can see, in N and H star. The second step is to prove coercivity of T. So <clears throat> uh, there exists a, a positive constant C so that we have this inequality for all pair of F and G and L2. And this is exactly coercivity of T. So since I, I don't have time to talk about the proof, uh, I just, just say the ID. So, the idea is that we will write the left hand side explicitly. Okay. And we have two terms, S1 and S2. So we try to, we have some positive terms, thanks to the assumptions that we made earlier, which are the blue terms, and some possibly negative terms, the red terms. We, we will try to make these blue terms dominate the, the red terms. And the, the S2 uh, consists of two integrals. So we try to, calculate these integrals explicitly using the radiation condition. And then we can prove these inequalities. And finally, we end up with this in inequality. And then the existence of the coercivity constant C is just proved by contradiction. Okay, so having all those things, we can finally prove theorem three. So in theorem three, it turns out that in N is a compact self adjoint and positive definite operator. And then we can define the square root in this way. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so, and we can prove this identity. So we can prove that the range of S star is equal to the range of the square root in N. Okay. So again, the right hand side can be computed from the data. So we know what it is. And it is equal to the range of S star. So com combining this with theorem one, the characterization that we, we had uh, earlier, we have a full characterization of D. So point Z belongs to D if and only if these sequences belong to the range of the square of in N. So again, these sequences can be computed because we know what the Green's tensor is. Okay. And the range of a uh, square of in N can be computed from the data as we discussed earlier. Okay. So this is a very nice uh, characterization. So, so uh, 
uh, you mean the uh, left hand side uh, uh, says the the breast cancer, and the right hand side is mm -hmm. uh, uh, the math or the tools you use to detect it. Mm, yeah. So here, uh, the the ring this this one we can calculate from uh, the data, and yeah. this sequences can be calculated from uh, from this. Uh, this definition, yes. So we know this function, which is just case where case uh, parameters, uh, gene is defined this way, and yeah. we can yeah calculate this. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And and yeah, this is from the data. So yeah, if we can do this, if we can de determine this, then we have uh, we can know if a point is inside or outside the structure. So mm -hmm. yeah, and uh, so theoretically, we're done, but in order for a computer to be able to to do this determination for us, we need to uh, to go just one more step. So that characterization is equivalent to this characterization. So uh, we uh, exploit the uh, eigen system of the of EMN using a PCOS criterion. So this sequences belong to the range of square of EMN is equivalent to saying that this sequence. Uh, sorry, this series converges. Okay. So this is something that a computer can do. So uh, uh, we will plot the reciprocal of this series because uh, when Z is inside of D, this series converges and the reciprocal will be a positive number. And when Z is not in D, this series diverges and the reciprocal will be zero. And that is exactly the indicator function that we, we wanted to build. Uh, and uh, so now we show briefly some numerical examples to see how uh, the method performs. So just some remarks. Uh, we computed uh, we computed the eigen system using SVD, and also we we can only compute uh, a finite number of terms in a series because on the computers we, we we cannot compute infinitely many terms. So we use uh, the reciprocal of the truncated series uh, instead of the full series. And here's the list of parameters. But the important thing is that this is a, an example of parameters that satisfy the, uh, the assumptions that we made earlier. And we also use 2% of noise in the data. Okay. So the first case, uh, we have aligned spheres. So uh, on top, we have uh, the cross sections. On the bottom, uh, we have the, the 3D pictures. And on the left, we have the exact geometry. And the right is a reconstruction. So. Uh, we can see that the method reconstructed very well the, the shape uh, of uh, these spheres. The second example is aligned cubes. So this is a more challenging example because this structure has uh, sharp corners and structures with sharp corners are harder to reconstruct because we need high resolution for the reconstruction. We can see here that in the cross section, we can see some uh, the picture of the corners very well. And also the 3D pictures look pretty nice. So um, the third example is a line bar. So this, this object is infinitely long in the X2 direction. And the method was also able to reconstruct this case. And finally, we have the perforated sheet. So this is an example that I showed in the very beginning of the talk, and uh, which is very challenging. Uh, I would say this is the hardest case because uh, <coughs> uh, here, but here we can see that it was able to reconstruct the route holes of the, the perforated sheet very well. And uh, so that wraps up my talk. Thank you everyone for your attention and thank you for all the questions.